Dr. Mitchell is an associate professor in atmospheric science at the University of Bristol, um, and I, an ERC research fellow specializing in climate change impacts on atmospheric circulation, extreme events, and human health. He will explain the effects of planetary warming to EKJP participants, as well as delve into his recent research on how low emission scenarios consistent with the aims of the Paris Agreement may impact society for changes in health. So um, normally we'd have a round of applause to welcome our speakers, but uh, I don't think the technology can quite deal with 35 people clapping. So let's have a silent <laughs> welcome. Uh, Dr. Dan Mitchell, please take the room. I will spotlight you in a second. Great, well, th you know, thanks very much for having me here. And, um, uh, you know, just one, one thing to say is, although I am Bristol based in the UK, I'm currently in Spain, um, doing my self isolation out in Spain, because um, it's just warmer than the UK. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm here. So thanks very much to the committee members for inviting me. And um, I was particularly excited to get this invitation for a number of reasons. The first is I think student conferences are, are, are potentially the most important thing you're going to do in your career. And, and I was a PhD student 10 years ago, and the colleagues I met there are the colleagues that I still work with, and, and they are now in, in, in such different areas that you can contact these people at the drop of a hat, and, um, and you know, you have someone in government, you have someone in in some aid agency and things like that. And it's so important in the, the connections you build at these conferences go beyond just work. They, they, they turn out to be your friends and that creates a very different working environment for you when you're later in your career. So, so I was particularly um, excited to see this conference for that reason. The other reason is um, I'm a, a real, fan of Japan. In fact, I would say it's my favorite country. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the most visited country I've been to outside of Europe. Um, and we, you know, try and go every couple of years. So, you know, I love the culture and, and the people there. You're all great. So, so I'm, uh, I'm especially glad to be chatting with you guys. So uh, I might need to share my screen here. Is that? Yeah, that's okay. So let's um, Okay, I need the host to enable sharing. Uh, it can always be a little bit tricky, but um, the, the easiest way I found to enable sharing is just to make me a co-host. Um, yeah, great, you've done it, excellent. So, okay, you should see my desktop there now. Um, can one of the committee members just let me know if you can see uh, if you can see this okay. Maybe just unmute your mic. Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Great. Okay, so, so I'm Dan Mitchell at the University of Bristol, and in particular, I represent the Cabot Institute for the Environment. So the Cabot Institute are an uh, interdisciplinary institute, and, you know, we, at Cabot, we believe very much that climate change is not a single subject area. And again, that's great to see there's so many different um, degree types from you guys uh, being represented in this conference. So climate change, it very much started as a science problem and uh, it, it's essentially a fundamental physics problem um, based on the uh, equations of motion and uh, the equations of radiative balance. And I'll talk a little bit about those in simplistic terms later. But we now, we now understand a lot about climate change and we understand that it's not just a science. It's the economy, it's the law, it's how uh, policy interplays, it's health. Um, it's, it's a hundred different disciplines. And actually in the UK, our, our university degree system's not set up very well to study climate change, because we normally silo a degree. So we normally have a, a degree in, in physics or a degree in mathematics. Um, there's only a few institutes which have a, a, a degree in climate change or climate, and they're normally just a one year master's degree. So I'd be very interested later on to hear um, about Japan's experiences with that. 
I work a lot with the University of Tokyo um, and uh, an institute in Tuscuba, uh, which for the UK people, that's, that's the east of Tokyo, and also the University of Kyoto. So I know at those institutes uh, sort of what's going on. So I'm going to talk to you about climate change and I'm going to give a broad overview of climate change. And I'm going to refer a lot to this, this 1.5C um, keyword. Some of you may know what that means. I, I suspect most of you won't. So that refers to the globally averaged temperature that we do not want to exceed under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And the Paris Agreement on Climate Change really is the, the biggest thing in climate change at the moment. It's a very ambitious um, initiative to, to cut carbon emissions. And uh, I'll discuss a lot about that later on. So before I get into the meat of this presentation, I'm going to be, um, oh, let's just, yeah, I'm going to be doing some polling so that's, that's a, my attempt at getting you guys to be able to engage. And normally I would ask these questions in the lecture and we would just do a sort of raise of hands. So this is the first time I've used this software, but colleagues have used it and it's very good. Um, so I think it's worth just taking a couple of minutes now, if you guys can go to this web link and I'm gonna post it in the chat because I think that's, um, uh, I think that's probably going to be easier for you to look at. So let's just go to the chat. Um, I forget where the chat is, actually. I thought that should have come up already. It's at the bottom of the page. So in the uh, footer. Um, yeah, I still can't see it. Yeah, and perhaps if you uh, stop screen sharing. Maybe mm -hmm. yeah, I've posted yeah. so you can see. Oh yeah, oh yeah, thanks. Uh, that's great. Yeah, so if you just if you copy that link and go there, and then you will need to sign up. And I'm sorry if this is going to cause a little bit of trouble. I did it this morning with a few people, and it shouldn't take more than a minute. Um, but I think it, it's a good way to engage, and perhaps some of the later lecturers throughout this conference will use it as well. Um, and then, so I'll give you guys a minute and then we can just talk a little bit about some of the questions I'm going to ask. Uh, actually, it's probably good that I stopped sharing because otherwise you guys are going to see these questions. So there should be one question active. And while you're signing up, then I'll, I'll go through that question and then we can sort of see, um, we can see what goes on there. By the way, it's, it's quite hard for a presenter to see if people raise their hands, so I'll rely on the, the steering committee to let me know if there's questions, and, and feel free to stop and ask questions throughout um, whenever you, you're ready. So hopefully you're signing up now, and you can do that on your mobile phone or on your laptop, either's fine. And the first question I'm asking, just to really sort of see where you guys are at, is do you think the climate is changing? And there's five possible answers here. Um, no, so that just means there's no climate change at all. So the climate remains steady throughout time. Um, yes, but it's entirely driven by natural cycles. So large volcanic eruptions or solar activity. Yes, but it's mainly natural cycles. So that means there's a little bit of human activity in there, but it's mainly natural cycles. Yes, but it's mainly human activity. Um, so that's saying that predominantly it's human activity causing climate change, but there's a little bit of um, natural variability in there as well. And then the final answer is there's no natural variability. It's just all human activity causing this change. So you just select, select one of those answers. Um, and then I'll have a look in a second uh, how, we're, how we're doing. I'm not going to... I'm not going to go to that area now because you guys will just see how everyone will have voted and that might influence your vote. By the way, just, just so you're um, aware, I can't tell who's put what answer down. So, so don't worry about getting the wrong answer because no one will know it's you. And, and, and most of the questions I'm asking, there are no wrong answers. Um, apart from this one, there, this, this one's quite a, a clear one. 
So I'm going to stop sharing again, just so I can see what the answers are and not give them away to, to you guys. Um, and to see if anyone's actually managed to log in. Okay, we got through, okay, great. We've got um, lots of answers. So I'll, I'll start sharing again and we can, um, we can go through them. So you should be seeing that and you can see that no one said no. So that's the, you know, that is a, a particularly stupid answer. Um, the climate's definitely changing. All you have to do is look at any data. The more interesting question is why is the climate changing? And we know that there are natural cycles and we know that there are human uh, induced cycles, but there's always going to be an interplay between the two. So, so again, answers B and E are not correct here because even though the sun in, in volcanic eruptions don't really influence it that much on the timescales we're looking at, um, they do play a role. And if we were to look back millions of years, then they play a very important role actually. If we do get a large volcanic eruption, there, there's a clear signature in the climate there. Um, so the answer is D, so well done to 81% of you. Um, uh, I certainly see why people would have put C and E as well, so they're, they're not stupid answers at all, they're, they're very good answers. It's just that D is the correct answer here. Most of our climate change is human activity with a little bit of, um, uh, with a little bit of natural variability on top of that. So I'm gonna ask one more poll and then I'm gonna go through, through, through some slides. So I'll stop sharing again. If you, if you just reload that link uh, in a second, it should show the latest poll. Um, I'll, I won't get rid of these polls so I can send them to the organizers as well because they probably, they might make some, some good reading for your reports as well. So this next one, I've just activated it. So hopefully you can see it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a word cloud. So these things I think are always real, really fun. You need to put in a word or a sentence which says, what does climate change mean to you? And then we can see out of the group of, um, I think there's 35 to 40 of you, we can see when people think of climate change, what do they really think of? So there's, there's definitely no wrong answers here. It could be the first thing that comes to your head or something you've read about recently. Um, and we'll just see what words really pop out at us. So I'll give you another minute just to do that. Feel free to put a short sentence in as well if that's useful. Okay, it's look, there's lots of really nice words in here, so I'm gonna start sharing again and there's some, some clear ones popping out. These things are always really fun to do, by the way, so I do encourage you to, to, to do them as often as you can. So hopefully you should see now the word cloud. It's still changing because people are still putting things in, which is, is great, but may, you know, maybe you could stop putting things in now um, and we can focus on, on what's up here. And um, increasing is clearly what's on most people's mind here. Um, and and that's, that's great. And that's what we're really trying to determine. How much is climate change increasing? Global, yes, it's something that's global, but it's also something which really impacts people at the sort of city level as well. Um, some of these words are really, really great um, as well multi-countries, I, I like that one. Um, this is something that does come across um, a lot of people. Polar, um, 
hopefully someone didn't mean polar bear there, that's overused, um, but, but polar amplification is probably the largest climate change signal in, in, in our field, and that's a particularly important one. Um, I see the word extinction as well in here. That's a very interesting one. Um, we, we do feel species can go extinct there. Um, some very hardline climate activists will say that climate change can push human civilization into extinction, but I, I would very much caution that that's not really what we feel as scientists would happen here. We feel we could adapt, it would be very de detrimental and there would be a lot of loss of life, but there's very few people who would think this is an extinction level sort of event. So great, well thanks for that. I, again, I'll save that. Um, let's, let's move on to the actual presentation. There's, there's a few slides later, um, but we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll there's, a, there's a few polls later, but we'll go back to them. So why do we care about climate change? First of all, you know, it's just, it's just of scientific interest. Actually, as scientists, we're very interested in understanding how the world works, and you know, it just so happens that with this particular problem, it's something that does affect the entire planet. But the science of climate change is very different to, to what we traditionally think of. And I did my training in um, undergraduate in astrophysics, and there, you know, we had a set of theories, and you could clearly write those theories down, and then you could um, you could prove them quite quite easily in some cases, anyway. For climate change, it's not like that. And people are too used to, um, you know, Charles Darwin's simple theory of evolution or, or Einstein's equation um, E equals MC squared. We don't have an equivalent in climate science. You can't write a, a simple equation down which proves that it's there. The science behind this comes from hundreds of different sources and hundreds of different lines of evidence. Um, but very few of them are just a sort of a nail in the coffin like uh, E equals MC squared. And that's why uh, initially there was a lot of debate on it. Now in the scientific community, there's very little debate. Um, most countries accept climate change is truth. And we've moved on now to understanding what the environmental impacts of, the, of that climate change is. So in this, this case here, I'm showing flooding. Um, increased flooding is something that we're very um, clear about is a problem with climate change. And that's not necessarily just the flooding itself. It's the fact that it, you know, people lose their houses, they lose their infrastructure. This uh, pollutes the clean water. So water supply and sewage systems get problems. And this can really lead on to the significant human impacts and you know, all the way to the mental health of people, which this occurs. I mean, if you had a flood which, where you lost your house or you lost a, uh, someone uh, very close to you, then of course you, you would be um, devastated. And so it, this goes back to the point I was saying, you know, initially we were just talking about science of climate change, but now we're going from the hardcore physical science all the way through to the social science and the psychology of the problem. And that, that's why it's great to have such a interdisciplinary group of, of students listening to this today. So what is the climate doing? This is, is probably the most famous um, graph in climate science. And what I'm showing here on the x-axis is a time series. So it's years and on the y-axis, I'm showing the global warming as an anomaly from the pre-industrial period. So, by the way, especially to my non-native English speakers, if there are any terms that are not clear to you, please, please say and, and stop me. Um, I do um, waffle on a little bit sometimes, but so pre-industrial period is, is the time where we don't feel we were emitting greenhouse gases. So we feel that's where our climate should have been stable with respect to the human activity anyway. And so the graph I'm showing here is the global mean temperature anomaly increase. So you can see here, this is a one degree increase um, and this is zero degrees increase. The black, very, very noisy line is our observations. 
So that's saying, what's the global mean temperature been at say 1900 uh, and it's around 0 0.2. And then you can see much more recently, so in 2020, we're much closer to one degree globally averaged warming here. Now, oh, that shouldn't have happened. So the, one of the techniques we have available to us is to use very, very large and complex computer simulations to model the climate. Now these computer simulations are, are huge and in terms of a model, it's hard to find a model in, in a scientific area which is as complex as this. So it takes a de order of half a year to run this model. Um, that, there's a lot of variability in that. It's made up sometimes of 10 million lines of computer code. In the UK, we employ around 100 people to simulate this model. In Japan, you employ a similar number. A similar number. Um, so, so they are very complex. And what we can do is we can simulate the climate. And I'll, I'll explain later why they need to be so complex. But what we've done here is in the orange line, we've shown what that climate would look like with human activity and with natural variability. And you can see that actually it follows, it follows the, the observed warming very, very well. Actually, this is just human activity, sorry. If we do just natural variability, it's the blue line. And you can see that our models don't capture at all this increase in temperature that we see over the last 60, 70, 80 years. So this is one line of evidence we have that this warming must be caused by human activity. It's because our models can't, can't capture it without including the human activity, whereas they do capture it very well uh, with the human activity. So that's a particularly important thing to, to understand. And that, in my view, is one of the strongest evidences we have of human-induced climate change. So what, what is our current warming level? Well, there's a great site that, that myself and colleagues did um, uh, back when I was in Oxford, and it's called Global Warming Index. And so Oxford still maintain this website, and it shows you what the human-induced warming is to date. So as of yesterday, when I, I printed this screen, it was 1.15 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So I talked about this Paris Agreement on climate change, and I talked about how we're trying to keep climate below one and a half degrees. So here you can see we're already over two thirds of the way to, to failing in that goal. So, so it's a particularly important limit, and this is rising quite heavily. I did have some discussion with my colleagues yesterday over how high this was, because it was a little higher than I was expecting from two years ago. Um, uh, but there were some changes made to this method um, recently. I'm not going to go into much detail on what these other things are. Um, often we, when we deal with carbon emissions, we have lots of different units and it's thoroughly confusing to everyone. So, so I'm not going to go into what they are, but just you can see that we're talking about trillions of tons of carbon dioxide, which has led to this 1.1 degree warming. And, and a lot of people say it's, you know, why is it all about carbon dioxide? It's not the strongest greenhouse gas. Things like methane um, uh, are stronger greenhouse gases. But the problem with carbon dioxide is once it gets into the atmosphere, it just stays there and it remains there and it remains there and it remains there. And actually it can last in the atmosphere for tens of thousands of years. So every bit of climate change we do now will be there essentially for as long as, as, uh, as our memories, the sort of human race goes on for. Things like methane, while it's more potent greenhouse gas, that drops out of the atmosphere after 10 or 20 years. So, so while it's important, it's not something, if we stopped putting it into the atmosphere in 20 years time, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have mattered. So that's the real importance here. So here's a, another, poll. So if you go back to that same link, and I'll stop sharing again. Um, the question is, who is to blame for climate change? Um, I just need to activate that one. So just bear with me. Uh, 
Oh no, I've activated the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. Activated who is to blame for climate change. So you should be able to go there and uh, give your answer. So, so this one here is, I'm sure as soon as you see it, you'll notice there is no wrong answer. Um, I'm more interested in what your feeling is um, on this. Um, by the way, anyone who answers other to this, I might ask them to unmute their mic and just explain what they mean by other. So that might, um, that might mean you don't click on it because you, you don't want to talk, or it might mean you do because you've got a, a strong opinion. So either way would be great. So I've got a few answers in here, but I'll, I'll give it a little bit longer for a few more answers. Okay, let's go with that. I uh, Actually, this is a very interesting response from you guys, and I wasn't expecting it, but we'll, um, that says a lot. So here we go. So nearly all of you felt that everyone should take responsibility, which of course is, is a, a correct answer. Everyone should take responsibility. Um, this is probably only one person said other. Um, so I'll ask that person to, to give their answer in a second, but let's just go through the other ones. So the UK was, was pretty much the first country to go through an industrial revolution. Um, so we have, to, we have to accept the fact that we are partially to blame for this crisis. In fact, um, it seems very unfair that we are now turning around to developing countries, for instance, those in Africa, and we are saying to them they cannot emit carbon emissions, so they cannot have their industrial revolution, um, whereas we had one, and now we're nice and advanced in our technology that we won't let others. So that there's a problem there. America, they've pulled out of the Paris Agreement of Climate Change, which, which is unprecedented, and, and we're, not, we're not even sure it's legal to do that. But, um, you know, when America does something, um, it's hard to argue. So there's some serious problems there. But um, perhaps in December of this year, we might have another administration and they might sign up again. Everyone should take responsibility. Of course, that's a, a correct answer. It is responsibility of everyone and there's various things we can do um, for that. Uh, I put in China there, it's, it's currently the most polluting country, but um, you know they didn't start as much as say the UK did. So. So what I'm saying is there's lots of people you can blame here and, and perhaps we shouldn't be blaming, we should be working together as a, a, a collective of governments to, to address this problem. But actually, um, that's not the way countries work. They don't very often work well together. together. They're also very, very selective on, on what they want to do because a lot of governments, especially the UK, a lot of their policy is about being re-elected in four years time and climate change is a much longer problem than that so why invest a lot of money in climate change when your government won't really be seen as, as doing much on that so if they don't mind i'm going to ask the person who clicked other to un unmute and give their answer um so yeah i put other so i was basically i was just balancing between everyone should take responsibility and other, but I, my view is that it does require a degree of nuance because it is incorrect to say that everyone's equally responsible because it's, as a matter of fact, there's like what, like the top, like, I don't know, like 70% of um, like carbon emissions produced by like 10% of the population or something. I can't remember the specific statistic, but it's something like that. And that reflects the fact that, again, the majority of climate change is produced by a minority in our population. And within that, we've got like certain governments and certain like corporations who are more heavily involved in kind of like um, industries that promote climate change. And I think it's important that we recognise that they play a greater part because they, I think they should take great responsibility in resolving it. So I think it just does require slightly more nuance than just saying everyone is equally responsible. That's just my view on it. Yeah, well, yeah, well, thanks very much, Lisa. Did, did anyone else click other, by the way? It looked like it was just one person, but... Okay, I think it's just Lisa. Um, I mean, very well put, Lisa, and I completely agree with what, what you say. Um, you know, certain large 
emitters, not just at the country level, but actually at the what we call a, the sort of actor level, um, uh, emit 90% uh, of the emissions. So um, I believe the statistic is that something like 60% of 60% of emissions could be traced back to 10 countries. Um, and and uh, there's a lot of countries in the world. Uh, so yes, people do need to take responsibility in a different way. And that's why I think the UK in particular should, should take a lot of responsibility. They're doing a good job already. Um, uh, but yeah, the go governments need to incentivize um, these sort of initiatives. So they need to incentivize um, investment into electric cars, for instance, or they need to put a carbon tax on companies that emit these things. So um, yeah. So thanks very much for your comment, Lisa, and um, yeah, I completely agree. So I just thought it would be interesting and, and, and moving a little bit away from blame here, because as we sort of, hopefully you picked up in that conversation, you know, who's emitting the most at this time is not necessarily who's emitting the most before, and there's various other things at play here. But this is one of these interesting world maps which shows um, who's currently emitting the most carbon dioxide. And you can see that China, US and Russia um, are, are up there. Um, Japan is very high um, and so is India. Uh, this is perhaps not that unexpected. These, these countries are all, um, you know, very highly populated countries and, uh, you know, very technologically advanced. If I move on, um, the perhaps more interesting comparison is to do it per capita. So that just means it's sort of population weighted. So if you've got a larger population, it does it. Um, and this is the more meaningful graph. And you can see here that the United States um, is emitting the most per person. Um, Japan is, is fifth and they're beating the United Kingdom here. Uh, this is this is one where if you're beat if you're winning then you're you're losing if you know what I mean, um, uh, but you could say that in anywhere India or above are not doing particularly well in this diagnostic here, and so um, you know it's an important thing to think about. And um, later on we'll talk about individually what we can do to reduce uh, our, our carbon emissions. So you know to take a little step back we talked a lot about the global climate and the global emissions and um, when it comes down to it who who really cares about the global quantity that's not something we feel and as I showed you before we're talking about one degree or one and a half degree and actually do we really care about that um, you know I put a few examples here um, this is this is Atlas in the middle um, from Greek mythology, sort of holding up the world. So he might care if it's really hot. Um, someone holding the world in their hands. This here, um, many in the UK will know where this is from. This is uh, from one of our very famous authors, Terry Pratchett, who, who's a really amusing and great author. Um, hopefully, uh, he's made it out to Japan as well. Uh, his books have anyway. So again, these elephants might care about. Uh, the global average temperature but in in general we don't we care about what the level the temperature is where you are or or in the field where you're growing certain crops because that's what's important for, for livelihoods so i wanted to go through a few um a few news articles of where climate change has occurred in news just to show you you know most of these are in the last week or some are a, a little bit older but but you know these are where actually climate change is being really important. So, so this was 20th of August, so probably a week or so ago. Um, unprecedented ice loss as Greenland breaks record. So uh, this these occur in on the BBC pretty much monthly. New records being broken. Greenland has a hell of a lot of ice. Um, after Antarctica, it has the most amount of ice that we're worried about. Um, so if all the ice in Greenland melts, we've got serious, serious problems. Um, um, so that's one of the largest concerns in climate change. Many of you will know um, Greta Thunberg. Um, she, she, in England, she often has mixed views. You know, some people are thinking, yes, she's, she's amazing. Look at what she's doing. Others are sort of thinking, 
Um, she's, she's talking about science as if she knows it. Um, uh, and maybe she should not be doing that. And I think to those people, they've lost the point of her. And that's the fact is there are people not listening to the scientists. And so Greta's done, I, in my view, has done amazing work at promoting um, scientific views of, of the scientists out to the public. So she's back at school this year. Um, so that was in the news. Um, uh, CNN, try this earth-friendly diet. So there's a lot about diet in climate change. And I, I think you might have a speaker later on in your schedule on diet. And that's, that's great because that's a really interesting thing um, to discuss. And there's a lot that can be done for the climate change problem in terms of diet there. Uh, removing CO2 could spark big rise in food prices. So again, that comes into the, the diet thing, but you could see that actually that's a different sort of side of climate change you know there are always positives and negatives here um so this was particularly interesting because it was a japanese um one and i'm sorry that most of mine were probably more uk centric articles but this one here first undeniable climate change deaths reported um in a study now i don't actually think this headline is is a very good one um the study they're referring to uh, had some potential issues, I think, um, mainly with the phrasing of the words, but I think it's very difficult to say that climate change has undeniably caused um, heat wave mortality, for instance, um, but that was that. And I think the final one I put up here, campaigners attack Japan's shameful climate proposals. Um, which I thought was incredibly harsh, considering um, Japan has got some, some amazing climate proposals. Um, this is the media just trying to mix up a storm here. Um, Japan, as with most countries, could be doing more. In fact, as with every country, could be doing more. But Japan is doing, you know, certainly up there with the best of us in, in its climate change um, plans. So, so I think that was a harsh title and don't necessarily agree with it. So how complex is the problem? I talked about these really difficult and complex models we use um, when, we, when we look at this problem. And so I just wanted to show you a, an animation here of just the ocean component of the Earth system. Uh, you might be able to hear that music. Um, sorry if you can, I didn't mean it to have music, but it's got it. So here, this is showing the the currents in the ocean and you can see just how complex our ocean is here so this here is uh, uh, this particularly interesting this is Texas up here and we've got a tropical cyclone heading towards Texas right now I'm not sure if you've seen the news but you can see these currents bringing up water here you can see these are what we call eddies so spiraling uh, uh, water here going on to Africa you can see this this um, spiral of um, eddies coming off this current here and this is a western boundary current um, it's a very well known and, and it's an understood uh, phenomenon in climate science and you can see the complexity here and our models need to capture all of that they need to capture that fluid dynamics and that can be really difficult to do especially if this is just one component it's it's the ocean component i'm not going to show you the whole video but let's just wait till we can see japan here and you can see this this current here coming right up here which, which is bringing warmer waters to, to japan here so your climate is warmer than than others at the latitude um, because of that so i'll just stop there with the animation in, in a sense i'm just trying to get across how complex the problem is and what we do is we, we model these at, at each point in time and each point in space, we model that movement of, of water or air using this set of equations. And those of you studying maths will probably look at this and think, actually, they're not very complex equations, they're just partial differential equations. Those of you who haven't studied maths might think they, are, they do look very complex in, in, in maybe a different language. But the problem with these equations 
is that we can't solve them. And that's the fundamental problem is we cannot solve them because there's too many unknown variables here. Um, so it's not the fact that we, we're not clever enough to solve them. It's just that the way they're set up is that they're unsolvable. So we have to use a climate model to best predict what's going on here. And that's what we do. And that's why we, so we have to solve all these equations at every different location on earth at every second on earth. So we run the model and then, and then five seconds later, we do all the calculations again all over the earth. And then five seconds later, we do them all. And you can imagine that leads to millions of different calculations, especially when you think we do these below the ocean as well, and we do them up into the atmosphere. So that's why, you know, a lot of what we say comes across with, a, with very high uncertainty. It's because we, we, we had to predict these things. So let's go on to another, uh, an, another poll now. And this is what aspect of climate change worries you most? So I just activate that again. Um, bear with me. Okay, that's activated. So you should be able to see that. Again, it's the same link as before. You know, I, I, thinking about on this, I should have put more um, option, option E's and, and other so that people can give their, their concerns. But maybe when you, when you have your more general discussion, you can bring some of these out because um, rather arbitrarily, I put four answers in here and I'm sure many of you have um, much better answers than these. So, okay, great, we've got, We've got a number of answers now, so I'm going to share screen again. So here we go. Um, it looks quite even across the board. Um, this is quite an interesting one. I asked this sort of question when I was in the Caribbean a couple of years ago, and sea level rise was, of course, their, their main concern there because half their island would be underwater. So it is an interesting one. Um, the economy seems to have got a little bit less attention than others. Um, my feeling is that's probably because it is particularly complex. Um, but of course, if you have a failed economy, then, then your health services, your emergency relief services are all um, insufficient as well. So, so all of these are, are good answers. And um, you know, if I were to pick one, I would probably pick a different one every day myself. So. So it's great to see that sort of level uh, in there. Great, so let's talk a little bit about local impacts. And here uh, I'm talking about temperatures in Japan. Um, I suspect that there are a few in the UK or most of you in the UK haven't been to Japan, um, but hopefully some of you have. So the climate is of course different to what we have in the UK, although it's not, sufficiently different considering we're, we're so far apart actually there, there are a lot of similarities um, in Japan they define extreme temperatures uh, when they exceed 35 degrees so, so that's essentially five percent of summer temperatures exceed 35 degrees and so that's hotter than the UK um, uh, especially uh, going up towards Scotland for instance and um, uh, that would be interesting. Uh, just to make you all a little bit jealous in Spain at the moment, it's 37 degrees where I am, so I would be in this extreme temperatures um, here. Um, 2018 was a very hot summer in Japan, and actually that did lead to a number of um, people unfortunately passing away, uh, and the estimates are around a thousand people lost their lives due to that heat wave, um, which nowadays is, is is quite a few people actually. Um, these people are generally older and less able to, to adapt to people, um, not, to, not to diminish, of course, um, anything on that regard, but it's not, for instance, something we often compare these, these very large catastrophes. And of course, there's been a lot of comparisons with COVID, uh, which also 
which also um, impacts the elderly much more um, significantly here. Heat waves do impact the very young, of course, which um, is a difference as well. But mortality from heat waves is not just from physically altering someone's body state. So it's not, so it could be heat stroke uh, or cardiovascular fa failure. But there are lots of other problems with, with heat waves. For instance, um, suicide rates go up, domestic abuse goes up car crashes go up and this is all because the human body is very stressed and so mentally the, the state changes and so we we do see those things as well so uh without human induced warming um we don't think the 2018 event could have happened it, it was extremely unlikely and if we look at the graph here these are from some colleagues in japan um I wasn't involved with this study, but um, I worked with people who, who were. And what they did is they used those really complex climate models and they calculated a sort of uncertainty range of, of, of the temperatures in 2018 if there'd been no human warming. So that's the blue line here. Apologies for the units on the x-axis. This is Kelvin. Um, uh, if you minus 273 degrees, I'm sorry, I'm asking you to do that. I'm, sh I'm sure many of you won't, won't bother. Um, but you can see this would be 20 degrees Celsius here. Um, so that's your, your height. Now, a lot of you are thinking, well, 20 degrees Celsius is not that high. Another problem with this study is they're actually looking at temperature a little bit higher in the atmosphere. So they're looking at it's something called T850, which is, um, uh, maybe a kilometer up in the atmosphere. So it's, it is colder up there. But this dashed line here shows you the heat wave in Japan over July, I think. Uh, yeah, July 2018. So that's what the observed value was. And what they're saying is if they model it without human influence, then actually you can't even get to that value. The red bar here shows what happens if you model it with human influence. And you can see that actually um, it's quite a common occurrence within this error bar here. So this study, which was by Amada et al, they actually claimed it was impossible to have this heat wave without human-induced climate change. And I, I quibble a little bit on that. I don't think it is impossible for, for various reasons. I, I think that's a very bold statement to make. But we can at least say it's extremely unlikely um, to have occurred without climate change. So that was Japan. What about the UK? Well, we don't get as high uh, temperatures. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about all the panels of this graph, but this, this was a study I did. And this is looking at, on the x-axis, the return period. So, so think of that as how often you'd expect this heat wave. So this is every 10 years, uh, this is every 100 years, and this is every 1,000 years. And in a similar way to the last study, I've modeled what the temperature would look like in red, which was um, like present day climate, and in blue, which is climate without human influences. So I looked at a different event. I looked at 2003. This was, a, this was the largest heat wave ever recorded in Europe at the time. It was unprecedented and it led to 70,000 people dying. Now, if you just think about that number a little bit, 70,000 people is a hell of a lot, and it's very, very comparable to the COVID signal. Um, not so many people appreciate just how, how many people lose their lives in these things. A lot of that was because certain countries in Europe were, were not prepared for heat waves as well as they should have been. Um, and if the same heat wave occurred now, that mortality rate would, would be significantly lower. But what you can see here is um, if we look at, say, a, a one in 10 year event, so a heat wave that occurs every 10 years, in the natural world, it's very low in terms of its temperature. But in a, in a, in a present day world, it's much higher. And what, what I did here was I linked these temperatures to a mortality model that we have. So it predicts how many people would die from 
from a current heat wave. And we found that in Europe, 30 to 70 percent of all of the death heat wave are avoided, especially in America, because it's been used to take to those big oil companies uh, or these big coal companies evidence that increased greenhouse gas has caused death for this specific event and and these sort of things are becoming undeniable now for for the larger corporations and in many cases they recognize it now and they they are doing what they say is acceptable to try and uh, mitigate against that behavior of course the bottom line is we need to move away from oil and coal um, to to, re, to renewable energy to, to change this. And that's the only way we can do this. So that was for the UK. What about globally? This was another paper that we published and it was led by uh, a colleague of mine at the London School of Tropical Medicine. And we looked at mortality. This wasn't for a specific event now. This was just mortality in general due to heat waves or or cold, uh, cold snaps. So I've got a graph on the left, which you won't be able to see the detail and that doesn't matter. All I want you to notice here is the points we have here and here's Japan. Um, that's where we have mortality data and we need that mortality data to understand this problem. So unfortunately, we can't do our research for the whole of Africa. And there's lots of sort of the Middle East um, and uh, Afghanistan in, uh, India and places like that, we find it very difficult to do this, this analysis. Some places like Australia look as if it's particularly difficult, but actually this is where the major, people just live on the coast in Australia. This is all desert, so we don't care too much about that. So looking at this graph here, let's not really worry about the, I deliberately excluded the axis. Um, red means the number of increased heat wave deaths we have in a country for, for present day climate. Blue is, is decreased cold related mortality. So of course, there is a benefit of climate change in that sense that, that uh, there are fewer cold related deaths. And um, you can look through here and you can see sort of who, who's doing well and who's doing badly. Japan, um, out of interest here, you're going to see much more of a reduction in cold related deaths than you are increase in temperature related deaths. So for this one single problem, actually climate change is potentially doing something good. That's not really the case because they're very different things here. UK, we see a similar sort of thing going on here. So that's just to give a, a view of, of what's going on. So I talked a lot about temperature but there are many other variables in the atmosphere which are important. Um, temperature is a very obvious one to study because it's, we have very reliable estimates and projections of what it's gonna do. If we look at precipitation or, or, or rain or lack of rain, the situation is much more difficult. Um, and actually, Droughts and flooding are two significant consequences of that. So one thing we do know about climate change is that a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. So we know that in general, there should be more flooding across the world. But different regions are, give very, very different results here. And if we just look at extreme precipitation, there are many different ways you can estimate what precipitation is going to do in the future. And what we've done here is we've, we've shown a graph of where those different methods agree or where they disagree. And so darker colors here show where lots of methods agree. So we have high confidence. And if it's blue, then it's increased rain. So you can see for extreme rain, everywhere on the globe we feel is going to get wetter. Uh, but for instance, in, in the Mediterranean region, we don't really have much confidence in our results. In, in Africa, in, in Northern Africa, we don't have much confidence. 
But in the UK and in Japan, we have strong confidence that you're going to, ha you're going to get wetter. Now this is, this, just to put a caveat on that, is an annual average. So that means in the, in the year as a whole, you're going to get wetter. It doesn't necessarily mean that your winters and your summers are going to get wetter. Actually, one phrase we often use is that is wet get wetter and dry get drier. Uh, and that's very true for the UK, that our winters are going to get wetter and our summers are going to get drier. I, I have to confess, I'm not sure if that's true for Japan, though. I'd have to look that up. Uh, with the mean precipitation, so average, you can see actually there's a few places where you're getting drier. Mediterranean is a region there. South Africa is a region as well, and there are a few others as well. So it's less certain now. So, you know, rain can come from a number of sources, and uh, some of them are incredibly complex. And one in particular is the hurricane. And hurricanes are extremely hard to model. Despite our climate models being really, really complex, they don't capture hurricanes very well. Um, so we have real trouble in understanding what's going on with them. And some of you, I suspect most of you won't know this graph, but this is a very famous mathematical theorem called Lorentz, Lorentz's theorem. And essentially, it's the mathematics which describes chaos. And the atmosphere is a chaotic system. And so one thing can lead to another thing that can lead to lots of other things. And in a sense, a butterfly, a butterfly could flap its wings on one side of the planet and, and months later that could have pushed it to the edge of a hurricane on the other side of a planet. Now, there's a lot that would go on there and that's a very simple analogy um, and probably not entirely true if I'm honest. But my point there is very small things can lead, can amplify to much, much larger things. And that's what happens in the, the climate system a lot. I'm not entirely sure how much time I have left, but I do feel I'm running out of time and I'm going to skip, skip over some of that and just talk about hurricanes in the future. You know, they are the largest, they're, they're the most extreme climate event that can happen in my view. Um, so, you know, the most extreme hurricane ever to occur occurred in Bangladesh uh, and it saw um, half a million people uh, dying, unfortunately. And that's a very large number. What are they going to do in the future? So these are the two Paris Agreement climate goals again. This is the one and a half degree climate goal and this is the two degree climate goal. And I, I've boxed out the numbers here because I think they just confuse people, but a down arrow means they're decreasing and an up arrow means they're increasing. So tropical cyclones, um, and just to back up a little bit, people call these things different. So in the UK, we call them tropical cyclones, although we never have any. In America, they call them hurricanes. In Japan, you call them typhoons, but they're all exactly the same thing. So tropical cyclones is just a catch-all term for that. Uh, but you can see in the future, we expect tropical cyclones to actually decrease. So we expect fewer tropical cyclones. But the strongest cyclones, and these are, we call them category four or category five, they will increase. So, so in general, tropical cyclones decrease, but the strongest ones will increase. So, so that's not great. Um, you know, at this point here, it's also worth mentioning a particularly famous typhoon that hit Japan. Of course, everyone in the Japan and the UK will know of it because it's the one that caused the Fukushima uh, disaster. And, uh, and that's one of the problems with climate change in general, but also these extreme events, is it's not just the climate impact on, on human health, for instance. It's the things that it does to our infrastructure in this case, of course, uh, to Fukushima. And, and things like nuclear power plants, unfortunately, they need to be built near coastlines because they use the water to cool them. So they're, they're very susceptible to a lot of climate change, including sea level rise um, and, and storms. So, 
So it's not just the climate, it's these secondary things. And of course, the most obvious and recent example of that is we are currently in a climate crisis, but we also have a COVID crisis overlaid on top of that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just finish with one case study and that's this, uh, a super cyclone that hit Bangladesh a couple of months ago. Um, you know, disastrous hurricane. If like the UK, Japan don't really get news from this part of the world, you, you may be unaware of this, but this was a very large um, hurricane that hit, that hit Bangladesh. It uh, didn't cause nearly the amount of death that the, um, uh, the larger one did in the 1970s, which, which led to half a million people dying. But it did cause a lot of destruction. And I've been working on this cyclone with an aid agency called the Red Cross. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, the Red Cross are a humanitarian agency and they've been out in Bangladesh. And you can see the villages destroyed here. So, so this was taken about around a month ago. Uh, this is India because it hit parts of India as well. These electrical lines um, were what caused most of the mortality this time. So a lot of people were electrocuted because the electric lines fell into the, the flooded, flooded water. But you can see these villagers are building this dam here that they're on top of um, and they, they're building it by hand and they've got to work together. It, it's, a, it's a very different part of the world with very different problems to, to what we're used to. These are just some more figures. This was, a, this was a village which you could walk in before and you can see the flood waters uh, going along here. And again, various people um, helping to stop that. But then people just going around about their business as well, you know, driving through these flood waters. There's a lot of damage done, done to that. Uh, it's said that this was the most costly in terms of finance cyclone that hit. Um, Bangladesh. Uh, again, I'd be a little skeptical of those numbers. The Bangladeshi government do like to over-exaggerate things um, like this. So I think this is my last slide and I'm going to finish with one more poll and that's what we can do personally to help reduce climate change. Uh, and again, you know, I, I sort of wish I'd put an other option in here, um, but I haven't. So uh, again, you could potentially uh, do that later. Okay, so it's activated now, so you should be able to go on there. Um, and uh, yeah, see what, the, see what your answers are. Now, I had to confess, giving some of these, these answers has upset people in the past, and I, I, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to upset people, um, but these are, these are some of the most uh, obvious ways you can sort of help. Okay, I've got, there's, there's lots of, uh, yeah, lots of good answers here. Um, so let's go back to sharing. Okay, so there, there you go. Uh, I mean, I actually, to be honest, I'm a little bit uh, surprised again. Um, you know, if I were to pick an answer here, I would, I would have probably picked uh, right to your government. And the reason I say that is the governments, you know, the governments have to push this forward. There's only so much we can do. Let's start with switching to a vegetarian diet. You know, uh, that's a very, that's a great thing to do. We know that certain meats in particular contribute a lot to climate change. Um, just, just to back up a little bit, that's not necessarily from, a lot of people say it's from the cattle, et cetera, giving off methane. That's not so important. Actually, it's more the distribution of that food around the planet um, or the cutting down of forest to, to, to get there. So switching to a vegetarian diet is great. You know, I have to confess that I, I eat meat myself. Um, but there are things you can do. You don't have to go entirely vegetarian if that's re a real struggle. You could, you could say, I'm, I'll eat vegetarian food for four days of the week. 
or you could you could say I'm going to just cut out the really really big um, greenhouse gas emitters. So so beef and lamb, uh, for instance, they contribute a lot. So for instance, if you went to um, uh, you went to have a burger, for instance, maybe you had a chicken burger instead of a, a beef burger, and actually you would half your greenhouse gas emissions instantaneously by doing that. So so that's a great one. You know. I, I do struggle when people say this is a solution to climate change because I, I don't think it is. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, shutting down McDonald's <laughs> it would be an extremely difficult task to do, especially in America. But I do think it's a very important thing that we can all do individually to help there. Take fewer flights. No one has picked that. Um, that's very interesting. You know, flights, at the moment, there's no real good alternative. Um, to flying because we can't have electric aeroplanes yet um, so they sort of have to we have to take that hit cars you could switch to an electric car if your country infrastructure was there writing to your government I sort of said about that you know lobbying I think is very important and you could all do that you could write to your MP or in Japan again I'm not sure if individual uh, regions have uh, representatives of the government there but you could write there and say it's important you could as the UK Japan conference write a collective letter and send it to the UK and the, the Japan government um, you know would be a great thing to do my English is very poor here that should have said had have fewer children but yeah so that's that's very controversial and of course I, I'm certainly not going to let you know how many children you should have you can have as many as you like but just so you know, every additional child you have will contribute a lifetime of, of carbon dioxide. So it's a decision you have to make there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have children um, and I certainly wouldn't say don't have children. <laughs> um, but, but maybe instead of having four children, you decide you wanted three children or something. And then switching to a green energy supplier, this, this is one that's actually just very, very easy to do. Um, in the UK it is certainly, again, I, I apologize, I don't know how easy that is in, in Japan. Um, but the, it is something easy to do and actually it's something you could consider doing uh, quite soon. They are generally a little bit more expensive, of course, which is, is not great, but you're certainly doing things there. So, so great, excellent answers there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the end of my talk there. Um, there's some stuff on the Cabot Institute here you could follow. Um, I'll, I'm happy to take questions from now. Or